Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real-life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. On today's episode of Careers Unwrapped, we're thrilled to welcome Fiona Campbell, who is a huge leading figure in digital media. She's currently controller of youth audience at BBC iPlayer and BBC Three, where she focuses on really captivating content tailored for audiences mostly under 35. And she's got a very rich background of roles as digital director for BBC News and also a whole load of extensive experience in producing investigative documentaries globally. She's also a trustee of Comic Relief. So, Fiona, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mark. I think what would be most useful at the beginning is to paint a picture of what a controller of youth audience at BBC iPlay and BBC3 actually does. So what's in your intray at the moment? What's a day like in your working life? I think the main priority is we are thinking every day about the key shows that are live at the moment and that we are wanting to commission that are going to pull in that 16 to under 35 audience. And what that requires on a daily basis from the moment I get up until the moment I go to bed is using many ways to assess how is a show landing? Where are people watching it? Are they watching all of the episodes? Are they watching half an episode? How is the footprint of that show working, what we call off-platform, so in the social media or increasingly even in the gaming space? And those decisions, are we're thinking about it day on day. It's a very, very fast-moving environment. And on any given day, something unexpected develops off-platform or with the show that we have to react and tweak to. So I, I have a background in news and current affairs, and that sort of fast-paced judgment and decision-making is still very relevant because the TV market is so driven these days by on-demand platforms, streaming platforms, of which, of which ours is iPlayer. So you must get a huge amount of data fed into you from all of those sources. How do you balance that sort of solid data-driven thinking along with just a creative gut feel about the shows that are going to land well with these audiences? We do have a tremendous amount of data from BBC audiences team and every off-platform business also supplies us with analytics. And again, I think over time with experience, you can see the editorial themes and subject matter that has consistent resonance. And on top of that, you can see with your presenters who have the most live, deep, ongoing relationships with their audiences off platform. So there is an element of predictability in it, but it does change as time goes on. So with the rise of Andrew Tate, for example, when we moved to make a documentary on Andrew Tate, we obviously knew that was a huge conversation off platform on YouTube. But we weren't sure if that was a conversation that people would want to have on BBC iPlayer or what was a piece of documentary around that. But we made a one-off documentary with two young journalists who had been following that story when they worked at Vice. And actually, they brought well over a million under 35s to watch that show on iPlayer. So that's a bit of the unexpected, but you can see the success of it somewhere else. So you do place bets, which sometimes go wrong, but you have a sense of how you're going to try and make it successful, like where you're going to push it off platform. Is it going to be YouTube? Is it going to be really important to think about TikTok? Is it going to be Instagram? You have a sense of, well, this is what we're going to push to try and make it work for us on our platform. And you mentioned the Andrew Tate documentary. What other programs have been unexpected surprises in terms of positive ones, ones that have just exceeded your expectations in terms of audience? Well, interestingly, so Zara McDermott has recently done a, a box set, so a four-part series called Ibiza Secrets of the Party Island. 
And it was a bit of a mixed format, which is a bit of a risk in that it was behind the scenes of the glamour of the island. So that's quite feature-like, mixed with a hard edge of police access into the crime that's active on Ibiza. We really weren't sure how that was going to go because it's that mixed genre approach. And actually it went down incredibly well and was very, very successful and reached large numbers. And I think probably the mixed genre approach was what brought the big numbers to it because people don't necessarily want to be traumatized or brought through a really dark subject for a whole hour consistently. That can be quite hard for people to absorb in an hour of their time. So I think a bit of the lighter access kept people with the four parts. And then we also did a one-off documentary with a company in Scotland called Firecrest, who for a very long time sought access with a police force who'd been prosecuting a young woman for falsely accusing a group of men of sexually abusing her. And she's been successfully prosecuted. And that was a risk in that was all the access going to hold together because you needed the access to actually be able to make one hour of television. And also it, it was quite a dark and challenging story. And you're again thinking, are people going to be able to handle this? And they did. And it had no presenter as the other thing, but it got really good numbers and really what we say popped on iPlayer as soon as it, as it landed. For a single documentary, that's very rewarding because it's obviously not a big primetime drama. It's a smaller piece of content. And looking ahead then, aside from obviously picking the right shows, the right content, what are the more strategic opportunities and challenges you're facing at BBC Three and iPlayer? So I think we all know that the audience, especially what we talk about, the 7 to 24 audience, their media diet has completely changed. And we've done some work to assess that time they spend watching long form video has drastically changed. So we're operating in a market whereby they might only be dedicating a few hours a week to the whole of the long form video market. And it's very hard for us when we are obviously spending our money on long form video. But what that has meant is that we have this year moved into the world of Roblox, for example. So we've launched a BBC Wonder Chase game in Roblox because Roblox audience spends two and a half hours a day on average in Roblox. So they have more of that audience's time than we would on a daily basis. And within that world, which is a game, an obstacle game world of Roblox, we represent Match of the Day, Doctor Who, EastEnders, Next Step from Children, We've launched yesterday an election game for the general election, which is brilliant to bring the idea of democracy to that age group. And we also represent, so Gary Lineker's in the game, Zara McDermott's in the game, Laura Koonsberg and Clive Murray are now in the game. So this is a hugely innovative pan-BBC move. And we've already had a million, it's been live about six weeks, a million visits. And it's got a really high rating within the experience. So that is, in terms of where my job start and where my job is now, I never thought I'd be in the metaverse and in the gaming world, but that's where it is right now. So you're now in a very data-driven, still trying to make creative judgments about content. You said it's metaverse, it's gaming as well. Now let's just roll the dial back a bit. How did you get your first start in this really rich and very career pathway you've had? What got you going? When I was at university, I did write a lot of letters to people asking them for opportunities. And I often said to people, you can't write 10 letters. You will be writing over 100 emails. That's just accept that. And if you want it that badly, that's what you will do. And I was living, studying in Italy at the time. And I wrote to Thin Invest, which was then the Berlusconi-owned media channel. So I'm writing to a world I do not know. I'm in a foreign country. And I wrote to their early evening news chat show, which was a bit like Newsnight, but a bit more lighthearted. They had some dancing on it as well. So Newsnight never had dancing. And I asked them, can I come and do some work experience? And they actually invited me to an interview in Rome. So I went and I was interviewed by their equivalent of Jeremy Paxman. And basically, they gave me a bit of work experience. And they nearly, they were going to offer me a job as a correspondent for them in Strasbourg. It all got very 
crazy quite quickly. But that meant I had a bit of experience, an interesting experience, even though it was just work experience. And that got me going for when I applied for my first six month contract with the BBC as a researcher on the money program. And I got that through applying through an ad in the Media Guardian and going through the interview process. And I think there are a lot of opportunities these days, but you need to track what content you like, track the company that's making it. You need a notebook where you keep who's the executive producer of those shows that you like, make notes as to what you liked about the show. And then you've got LinkedIn. You can drop these people emails, messages to say very succinctly who you are, what you want to do. And are they free for a coffee or are there any opportunities in their upcoming productions and contact them every six months. Keep in contact. Don't just give up. (laughs) You cannot give up. You've got to keep going because you're building a network for your career lifetime, not just for your first entry point to your first job. So there's people I know now who I met when they were on youth placement at the BBC who then moved through children's, then got staff jobs and now are out in the freelance market. And I met them first 15 years ago. As your career developed, you moved into documentaries set globally, including some sort of quite gritty ones within there as well. How did you take those first steps and then use that as a platform to move into that area in particular? Um, I think I learned very quickly that the most difficult jobs are sometimes finding case studies. It could be finding a specific kind of location or finding a specific kind of case study of an interviewee. And people would often give up too quickly, whereas I would phone 120 union representatives to find somebody in a local union branch that matched the interview brief. And then you build a reputation for it. That is the person who will get you that interviewee or get you access to that rooftop location which was purely through persistence. And that meant that when I moved to Panorama and wanted to do foreign reporting, people knew that I would lock down filming schedules. I would get the access. I would get literally foot in the door to get into places, which everybody and anybody can have. It was no great intellectual asset. It was just an ability to organize and produce and make things happen, even when it looked as if they weren't going to happen. And that is what gave me the opportunity to then go away and do foreign filming because the schedule wouldn't collapse. They'd know I'd make the schedule work when we were away. And what personally for you during that phase are the highlights for you? What's the thing you look back and go, wow, that was a great job? I think traveling, I was in filmed in Afghanistan under the Taliban. I filmed personally undercover in female schools, which were illegal, and the Taliban were are very scary and oppressive organization. And having experienced that and met Afghan women in that situation, I think that kind of changed how I view my own life and how privileged and fortunate I am. And I think that it it was literally a life-changing experience. Similarly, I did a lot of Al-Qaeda-related investigations. So we met before 9-11 a lot of Al-Qaeda activists who were then living in Britain before anybody really knew what they represented. And again, it just gives you this international perspective on the world that is in close-up witness to world events that is just kind of mind-blowing and shapes you personally for life. And I went to Iraq during the Iraq war as well. I embedded in the 7th Armored Brigade going into Basra. So these are all, when I say them out loud, it's incredible to think I've lived that life. Many years ago, I spent some time in the army and as part of that, some of that time was in Northern Ireland and some of it was in the Middle East. And the thing that still sticks with me most is the people that I met doing that, whether that was individual soldiers, whether it was people on the ground whose lives were being turned upside down by what was going on. And and that sort of personal connection far more than the big picture is what I remember most. And I'm wondering if, especially from what you talk about the time in Afghanistan, if there are particular people or memories that really stand out for you there. Definitely, because that was another example of meeting people. There were some women who were running very tiny NGOs for women so that they could meet together and so and just have emotional and psychological support at that time. 
And it was still a very dangerous activity, even though the Taliban would know that this was a small international NGO, which was literally run by one woman. And I could still see very clearly in my head walking into that house where they held those meetings and the women I met. And some of the young women I met said, I really want you to come and meet my father and my brother. And I, do you really? Because first of all, I had to wear the full chador right over me. And then I was like, well, if we're caught, this is just going to be, have serious repercussions. And we'd walk kilometers through Kabul in the heat, shuffling along, hoping we weren't going to get stopped. And I had lunch with this girl's father and her brother, and he brought out his old photograph book, which would have been strictly banned, of all the pictures of them dancing when they were students at Kabul University. And in the 60s, Kabul was a much freer society in terms of women's rights, students' rights. And that was just an incredible risk that they took to reach out and have communication with one individual journalist like me. I wasn't filming anything. It was just literally to go for lunch in their house undercover. And a lot of them managed to escape subsequently, but they never got to go back to their country, which is a terrible thing to consider. And then for you within your career, as you transitioned from very frontline journalism to now a much more digital first platform, how has your own approach to commissioning and content changed during that? I think it's just, I've always find it incredibly interesting to have the digital tools to see how audiences are literally live reacting to putting something out. And I find that's endlessly engaging. So we launched A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, a drama this Monday, and we put a lot of effort into launching exclusive trails before release, which garnered millions of views before the show was even released. And then we released the show on Monday and you immediately see the iPlayer consumption taking off. So I love that. That's by being very close to an audience, to seeing which elements of what you've produced the audience most react to and most spend time with. And basically the audience is teaching you and then you use that insight to go again. And I find that very addictive compared to years ago when all you had was put your show out and then see the next day when it was too late what the overnights were. And amongst some of these highlights, and you must have so many during a career, what's the flip side of the coin of that? What are the things you look back with, perhaps put your head in your hands a little bit and go, oh, that didn't go well at all. What are the fails that you've learned from on this career journey? I think there's many. I think you can work or drive yourself very hard and too hard, sometimes slightly down the wrong road. And the wrong road could be the wrong program, the wrong team, just the thing that wasn't the right place to land. So I always encourage people to go and work in many different places. You don't specialize too quickly. Like I have, I literally have gone from war zones to undercover filming to we have drag race and Roblox. So I encourage people to be very, especially early on in the career, doing lots of different things is really good. But sometimes I went to work on a few shows that I really wasn't that interested in. And if you land somewhere and you're like, oh, I really am not interested in this. I can't get out of bed for this. It's better just to call it a day and move on and not just flog yourself onwards on it, which is possibly what I have done. (laughs) I better not mention. And then the few things that I had the opportunity twice to go and work in America and American TV. And I didn't take the opportunity because I still had good opportunities in the UK. And part of me wishes I had given that a go. Some opportunities will come that are a bit, almost feel too big or too scary or too nuts. And just really do think, because some opportunities don't come around again. So that's one thing I wish I had to try one of those American outlets. When was that? How long ago? That was in the late 90s. And so what sort of programs or channels were talking to you then? It was ABC Network and it was long form current affairs programming. So it was right up what I was doing. But I ended up getting a a promotion back in the BBC in London. So I stayed for that. So it's just one of those things. But it's something I still think about it now, which is a sign. Like, And that's whatever, 20 years later, I still think about that. So with BBC Three and with iPlayer at the moment, you've got 
serious subject documentaries on there. You've got sort of real life business. You've got fun and drama on there as well. If I was a budding creative thinking, I've got just the thing for you, I guess in two parts. One is, how do I get to you? And the other is, how do I package it in a way that you're going to look at this or your team going to look at it and go, we should speak to this person? So the best thing first of all is that we have a new director's strand where we do single one-off factual programming. And all those films are incredible and do really, really well. They're very high journalistic bar, very original storytelling. So that's how Zara McDermott did her first film with the BBC. It was her personal story of online sexual harassment and bullying. And when it comes to presenting it, it has to all be very pithy and it could be literally one slide or if you're good at YouTube or Instagram, one video because you can show us the comments and the engagement or one slide that can truly illustrate why this, ideally through some factual analytical information, is the story for now with this audience. And for example, go back to the Andrew Tate piece, that film went out over a year ago, that was definitely a story for then <laughs> and for now. And those guys had very new information and access and all the data to tell you it was a huge story online. And what's the balance in, in content at the moment between commissioning where the idea has come from you or your team saying, we want to do something about this, as opposed to commissioning something where it's been brought to you, you hadn't thought of it and you thought this is right for the moment. There's a lot of ideas in the market because it's highly competitive. So there's hundreds of ideas coming at us all the time. So the majority, the vast majority of ideas that in the factual space that come at us come from the market because the market's a lot bigger than us. It's about tens of thousands of people. But through ongoing conversations, because that's part of my job is to meet and talk to indies all the time. And we WhatsApp messages and it's endless types of conversation. And we back things back and forward and things break in the news and we go, oh, what about that? So it's an ongoing dialogue as well. Ideas come from everywhere. And you mentioned how you started out and obviously how to enter careers changes over time. So if somebody's thinking, I want to get into commissioning. I want to get into production. I wanted to get into the behind the camera side of things. And perhaps their late teens, early 20s. From your perspective, from the BBC's perspective, how can they get going? Because it is so competitive. And a lot of them won't know anybody in the industry. How should they start? So there's a BBC Get In Instagram channel, which you have to join. And it's showcases and advertises all the deadlines for all the apprenticeship schemes in the BBC. The BBC's pushing through over a thousand apprentices in this group of years. The apprentices go from product development to production management, to editing, to technical camera skills, to journalism, literally every single facet of the TV and also legal, media legal, um, accountancy, every facet of television skills there's apprenticeship for. You do an apprenticeship, you will get a job. The training is absolutely second to none. Sky, I think, also does these apprentices. So if you are that teens, there's some for graduates, but the vast majority of them are for non-graduates. I cannot recommend highly getting an apprenticeship enough. On top of that, the biggest independent production groups, like your Endemol, Shines, Banerjee's, love productions, all three media, they all have their own schemes as well, which will not just be TV production, they will also be on the business side. If you go to those companies' websites, they advertise or else look for who's the head of production and email the head of production and say, do you have any new entrance schemes or do you have any trainee runner programs? Because the runners often when people get in. And no matter where you live in the country, find who your local production companies are where you live and say to them, do you have any apprenticeship programs, trainee runner programs, and can I apply and do it? That you'd be amazed. And if you go through Instagram, like I see, if you join the Northern Ireland Screen Instagram channel, they advertise various programs, various entry job opportunities in Northern Ireland on their Instagram. So you've got to go through. It's so much is get surfaced through Instagram. 
that is a great way to find out what's going on in your area. But apprenticeships are fantastic. And so much has clearly changed between these more structured methods of entry than when you started out. But if we also roll the clock back a bit and you're talking to your younger self, to 18-year-old you from a few years ago, with all of the experiences that you've gained, the successes and the fails, what advice would you pass on to your younger self about what matters to get ahead? I think you've got to really find the element of the job that you really, really are passionate about and will be passionate about it for 20 or 30 years. So I could have started off in a marketing department of a media company. But I think for me, I thank God I started off in the right place, which was journalism and production. I know people said to me, oh, we'll put you on camera. I never wanted to be on camera. Well, I did one tiny, but I mean, literally not my thing. So the best thing is to really drill into what is your passion? What element is your passion? Your passion could be camera work. Your passion could be editing. Your passion could be budget running for massive productions. Your passion could be specified. Find your passion and stick with your passion. Going back to when I went off and worked on programs or about things I didn't really, wasn't interested in, it doesn't work out in the end. So find your passion of skill and try and build around that because then that makes it a more enjoyable experience even when it's really hard and it will be really hard. So you have to have passion. And one of the attributes, I'm making a presumption, but listening to you now in, in the work that you do is I would say a lot of the more subtle forms of leadership. You have to engage all sorts of people. You have to inspire them to make commitments, to make decisions, to do something. How would you describe your approach to leading other people? I try to be very honest and very collegiate. So we're all in this together as a one level team. And we're all here to make things happen quickly and to have success and fun and to lead equitably and as my real self, because I think people can smell nonsense a mile off. So I, I tend to try, always say it as it is, try and be super honest to a fault. And I think then people are in for the journey because they see what the journey is, honestly. And People love being part of a fun team. I have a brilliant team, probably the best team I've ever had at the moment. And it's so much fun when you're in a great team who can rely on each other, celebrate what each other manages to achieve. That's the success. Like I love seeing other people now at my stage in their career. I love seeing them succeeding and getting opportunities. That's really great. And when you say your team, what is the team around a controller at BBC? What sort of people and roles make up your closer team? So my immediate team is very digitally focused. So commissioning, who are the people who shepherd through the long form content are their own entity. My team is very digitally focused. So our head of digital development who helps strategize on the off-platform distribution and set up the deals. I have executive editor of digital development young audiences, and he's driving the Roblox activation and also some AI experiments we're thinking about. And I have a head of content for BBC Three who does all the 24-7 daily editorial troubleshooting. Um, I have my executive assistant who keeps me in the right place at the right time, which is not easy. And a head of business affairs who manages the money, which again is not easy because it's a lot of money and it's dynamically changing and flowing all the time. And I have a scheduling team who are in charge of when we drop, how we drop. So that's about, of my close team, it's about eight people. And I think what's interesting there is it is emphasizing just the sheer variety of roles, even in one small team, like your close senior team there. And so when you look further, into the sector. There are so many different people and skills and backgrounds and level of training that are needed to deliver the content and to grow the audiences. Totally. Like some of my closest friends that I made through my career are the lawyers, (laughs) because I spent so much time with media lawyers, litigation lawyers, as we did really challenging pieces. And I learned so much of them. And they are people who have nerves of steel and they are, and I've been represented in court. I've had to go to court and 
give evidence and barristers have had to defend me. And that's a whole nother sphere of law, media law, freedom of speech law, that is really incredible. And I couldn't do without those people. Fiona, I think this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. I personally could go on for a lot longer here because I'm learning so much as well. But I think I've pulled out of this some really interesting points. If anybody's thinking, I want to take my career in this sort of direction, because you've mentioned a number of things here about the importance of networking, making lots of contacts and knowing you're going to have to put in the hard yards to contact a lot of people. You spoke about tracking the content seeing the stuff you like, seeing who's making it, the businesses, then the actual individuals in there, writing down what you like about it so you can get in touch with them and tell them. You've spoken about persistence as one of your strengths, but I can see that within the sector overall, the people who just can get it done. You also advise people to very much follow their passion and to maybe to help find that passion, to work in lots of different many places, to work in lots of different places in many environment. So I think those are all really useful, considered thoughts for people to take away. And I'd also add or to repeat what you mentioned about the different practical routes in, not just BBC, but Sky also having their very big apprenticeship schemes. And then personally getting hold of production companies, looking at runner roles, starting in that way, which comes really full circle back to the networking, contact a lot of people, know the content and have something to say to them. And that's going to help you get ahead. So Fiona, it's been really interesting, really useful. Thank you so much for unwrapping your career and showing us what your life at BBC and elsewhere has been like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck, everybody. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business or organisation to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.